So hello everyone again. My name is Jens Müller. I'm a PhD student at the Chair for Network and Data Security at the University of Bochum. And today I'm giving you an introduction on our current research, a joint work on printer security. You may ask, why would anyone want to try to attack printers? Why should we matter about those devices from a security point of view? Well, printers are quite everywhere. Um, they're contained in every household, every company, every educational institution, and have access to sensitive information, like, for example, um, business contracts being printed, like patient recipes, or yet unpublished research. And today I'm going to show you how incredibly easy it is to access those documents using 35-year-old vulnerabilities present in almost any laser printer. Okay, here's an outline of uh, today's talk. First, I need to give you some technical background information so you get a better understanding of the attacks to follow. Then I'm going to show you an evaluation with 20 printers um, using our Python toolkit, uh, Brad. And then I'm going to show you how to adapt the attacks to areas beyond printers, like, for example, to websites. Okay, let's start with some uh, technical backgrounds. What does it actually mean to print? If you want to print a document, you basically uh, need to do two things. First, you need to choose a printer language, <laughs> printer channel, excuse me. So um, a channel that is used um, to uh, actually print um, the payload, like for example, USB cable or one of various network printing protocols. And the second thing you need to do is to decide which uh, printer language you use. So um, for example, PostScript or PGL. So, the language that actually contains the document being printed. And there are many proprietary languages, but PostScript and PGL are supported by almost any laser printer. That's why we focused our research on those languages. The important takeaway here is that um, the attacks are independent of the printing channel. So whenever the attacker is able to print, she can perform the attack. OK, now let me give you a short introduction to PGL and PostScript. PGL, the printer job language, was developed by HP in the uh, 90s, and it soon became um, a de facto standard language for print job control. Now what can you do with PGL? For example, you can uh, set um, the paper size to A4 or set the number of copies. The important thing here is that those settings are not necessarily limited to the current print job, so you can potentially influence further print jobs. And there are other uh, interesting features with PGL. So for example, you can access the printer's file system through an ordinary print job. The other language of interest is PostScript. PostScript was the very first product of Adobe. And uh, some of us may remember it as a format for uh, document exchange. However, PostScript was originally designed for and is still heavily used on laser printers. So if you want to print a document, for example, a PDF file, and you use PostScript as a printer driver, um, what your printer driver does is actually it uh, simply converts the file to PostScript and sends it to the printer. Um, the important takeaway here is that PostScript is not a simple page description language. PostScript actually is a Turing complete programming language. So um, from the viewpoint of theoretical computer sciences, Given access to a PostScript interpreter already means uh, code execution, because any possible program, any possible algorithm can be implemented in PostScript and executed on the printer. OK, now um, let me come to the attacks. Um, our methodology in finding attacks was to systematically collect already available information, for example, vulnerability reports on printers and to um, systematically study uh, the standards, PostScript and PGL, and look which features, uh, which legitimate features of those languages are critical from a security point of view. Before coming to the attacks, I need to define three attacker models so you can see who is actually able to perform the attacks. Our first attacker model is the attacker with physical access to the device. It's quite a strong attacker model. However, ask yourself, is your department's copy room really always locked? Is your uh, conference's printer really never ever unattended? Well, it's only a matter of seconds for an attacker to launch a malicious print job via USB cable or USB stick and therefore permanently infect 
the printer with, for example, PostScript malware. Our next attacker model is the attacker with TCP IP network access to the printer. Again, you may ask, who would connect his printer directly to the internet? Well, lots of people do. These are current numbers from Shodan, the search engine for devices. And Shodan currently categorizes about 34,000 computer systems out there as printers. Actually, it's a lot more, but uh, consider an attacker who just wants to randomly target uh, some printers, and she can use Shodan and find over 10,000 devices alone in the US. Our weakest attacker model is the web attacker. All she does is control the contents of a website, and she somehow manages to lure uh, an employee within the same local area network than a printer to be attacked to her website. Now, she's able to execute JavaScript in the employee's web browser, and therefore trigger HTTP POST requests to port 9100 of a network printer, and therefore again send PostScript files, for example, or any other print jobs execute PostScript code on the printer. So the web attacker is able to uh, perform all the attacks to follow. In other words, a malicious website can read your print shops. OK, now let me give you some examples for the attacks. If you want to uh, cause a simple denial of service attack, what always works is uh, an infinite loop in PostScript. As said, PostScript is a programming language, and it's got all the constructs of a programming language, like loops. And by sending uh, this uh, single uh, line of uh, code to the printer, it tells the printer to do nothing forever and efficiently get stuck. So usually until the device is turned off and on again. Another example is bypassing protection mechanisms. Let's assume there is a system administrator, and he does his job very well. And he has set passwords everywhere. Even the printers are password protected. So um, our attacker wants to change some settings, but she can't. She doesn't know the password, right? What she can always do is, if she has got physical access to the device, she can uh, simply press certain keys documented in the manual and therefore reset the device to factory defaults. OK, what is more interesting is that, for example, on HP printers, you can reset the device to factory defaults through ordinary print jobs. So by sending this line of uh, PGL code to the printer, um, the device will uh, reset itself and restore factory defaults and therefore wipe out all protection mechanisms like passwords, for example. Only with the ability to print. OK, here's another example for um, the manipulation of other users' uh, print jobs. Um, remember, PostScript is a programming language. And one of the interesting features of PostScript is that you can override uh, functions, operators um, of the language itself. And when a certain operator is now called in a subsequent print shop, the attacker's version is executed. So this can be used, for example, to overlay um, arbitrary graphics, but also to replace text um, in, a, in a document of other users. For example, to introduce uh, misspellings uh, into the printouts of a certain user you don't like, or to lower the price in a sales agreement to be printed. And with the very same. Uh, principle that you, cook, that you can hook into other users' print jobs and access the data. You can also capture print jobs since, uh, since decades on every PostScript printer. Um, in practice, uh, there were some challenges actually we had to solve. For example, where do you store the captured print jobs? Um, if the printer has got a hard disk, that's easy. We can use PostScript to access the hard disk and save the files there. Else, we need to define uh, PostScript variables in memory and put the data in there. Later today, the attacker comes back and downloads the captured print jobs. OK, um, now let me give you an evaluation of the attacks. Uh, one problem actually was how to find enough test printers. And what we did is we uh, contacted the, our university's our system administrators and asked if they couldn't uh, give us some devices uh, for science. And uh, that worked quite well in the end. Um, we got um, 20 printers um, from eight different manufacturers, and it may represent a good mixture of what is used in a typical university or office environment. OK, uh, here are the evaluation results. We categorized the attacks into four uh, classes. This is the denial of service class of attacks. On the left hand, you can see the printer manufacturer. And red always means the device is uh, vulnerable. For example, the uh, infinite loop with PostScript almost always works. 
But um, there are other possibilities to cause denial of service attacks, for example, uh, using PostScript or PGL. And we were even able to cause physical damage to the printer on eight devices because we could exceed the printer's possibility to accept new NVRAM values. Because the printer's NVRAM, like with all embedded devices, it only accepts a limited number of um, write cycles. But within a print shop, you can cause one write cycle, or you can cause within a large print shop a million write cycles, and therefore destroy um, that um, unit. Okay, um, bypassing protection mechanisms um, work for about half of the devices, and for um, some devices even through ordinary print jobs. Um, the manipulation of print jobs, like overlaying content, replaying text, also work for uh, most of the dev devices. Uh, accessing the printer's NVRAM only worked for Prada-based uh, devices. Accessing the file system only worked for two devices um, to access the complete file system. But on many devices, we had read and write access through ordinary print shops um, using PostScript or PGL to certain directories only. This is not harmless because often you can find uh, passwords in there, like for example the device password, but also the scan, uh, scan to email credentials, or IPsec and Wi-Fi pre-shared keys, and so on. So this may be a good example how to escalate um, uh, into a network using the printer as a starting point. Capturing print jobs and uh, credential disclosure attacks against PostScript and PGL also work for various devices. Okay, now let me uh, give you an introduction to Brett. Our print exploitation toolkit uh, is a Python software that easily allows you to automate the attacks. It's released under the GPL and available on GitHub. Now what can you do with Brett? If you want to analyze your printer, you can type ls or show the other commands, uh, typical Unix-like commands. Um, it is uh, passed by Brett, translated either to PostScript or PGL, and sent to port 9100 of a network printer. So you do not speak, uh, need to speak PostScript directly. You just type ls, and uh, Brett does all the rest, translates it to a PostScript request, fetches the PostScript response, and uh, finally uh, displays the results of a file listing on the printer in a user-friendly uh, manner. And the same with PGL. OK, uh, now we thought, can we adapt the attacks to areas beyond printers? And, and this is pretty hard for PGL, because PGL is tightly bound to printers only. However, PostScript is used in uh, various other uh, areas too. For example, in the web. Um, first, we thought, uh, well, may, let's, maybe let's have a look at um, PostScript to PDF conversion websites. So, um, because um, converting PostScript actually means interpreting, means executing PostScript on the web server. Um, so there are not that many of those websites, but those that we found, most of them were vulnerable, at least to information disclosure attacks. Okay, but, but the problem is more broad. Um, we recently um, uh, analyzed the uh, um, top 100 online image converters, and we found half of them being vulnerable to the same attacks because they accepted <coughs> EPS files. What is EPS now? EPS stands for encapsulated PostScript, and it's uh, commonly known as an vector image file format, but actually it just contains plain PostScript again. Okay, now you may say, my, my website is safe, I don't uh, convert any images, right? Maybe uh, you allow your users to upload uh, profile images and generate uh, thumbnail previews. And then again, the um, framework that is used for image manipulation in the background, for example, image magic, may again allow uh, EPS code to be uh, executed. So let me give you an example. Um, here is uh, Dropbox. Uh, on Dropbox, you can upload EPS files, and um, they generate um, some preview image. If you generate a preview image, you must interpret the PostScript code, the EPS code. And um, what we have here in the something preview is uh, a directory listing on the Dropbox server, and we can see it in the something preview. Um, so this is not really a problem for Dropbox. We mail with them and they have uh, some sandboxing around and it's not the real file system that we see here, but not all websites have such extra layers of security. Okay, now let me come to a conclusion. Um, in the paper, we, um, we systematically analyzed PostScript and PGL, the printer languages, and we found both uh, of them from the standards on from the implementations to be insecure. And 
actually countermeasures are pretty much hard to apply because we only attack the, the languages that are used for printing itself. So for example, to capture print jobs, we only use legitimate features of the PostScript language. Um, and we applied the attacks to different areas beyond printers, like to uh, websites, for example. And further research may include um, having a deeper look at firmware updates, because it is common in the printing industry to deploy firmware updates as documents that are printed. Um, also, we may have a look at um, controlling the effects channel of MFPs through print shops, through PCI commands, so the attacker gets access to the phone line, or adapting the attacks through 3D printers. OK, um, let me come to the end of the talk. Um, Pred, uh, our Python tool to analyze to pen test printers is uh, freely, freely available. Um, test your printers, give me some feedback. And if you're more interested in the technical details, we have set up a wiki where all the attacks are explained in depth. OK, do you have any questions? Let's thank the speaker. Oh, I see people moving fast, OK? Oh, you're moving out or going for a question? No, moving out. Oh, there you go. There go. Then I have a question. So um, you're talking about printers. Uh, it was known in the community that these devices were sort of like broken or have problems with security. So wh what is, in your opinion, the angle that is different in this case from just pen testing yet another device? What is the specific that makes this different? Well, in my option, the interesting thing with printers is that you actually have data and code over the same channel. Because when you can print, you can do administrative functionality on the printer. There's no separation of, of rights. Whoever can print can basically execute code. So that's quite interesting. Isn't that a case, for example, also for databases? But you know, we, we don't study, I mean, we studied attack to databases, but is there something that goes beyond that the pen test of a certain technology, do you find something that is really printer specific that you know, capture your attention? Apart from the execution of code, which of course is bad. Oh, well, okay, execution of code is maybe um, uh, very abstract. Um, printer control in general, I would say, and doing this over the printing channel itself, um, I think that's, that's really the most important thing. And think about it, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, when they invented uh, PostScript, this wasn't a problem at all. It was years before the web. But um, nowadays, um, printers uh, don't, uh, we don't speak to printers using the parallel port anymore. Printers are network printers. We can use a website to attack the printers. So um, I think the manufacturers exactly knew that it may be kind of dangerous, uh, but it wasn't a problem in a closed environment. But now it's a problem to still support uh, those languages. So it's pretty, pretty easy to attack printers. Okay, is there a question down there? Okay, oh, there is one. Hi, uh, John Criswell, University of Rochester. So uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was the fact that you mentioned physical access. Um, and I imagine this is a pretty hard problem to deal with with printers because you have to pick up the paper from the printer, right? Um, do you have any ideas on how that could realistically be solved? Uh, it's kind of hard. <laughs> physical access control. Um, well, if you only allow trusted users, for example, um, to access the printing room, the copy room, that would work. Um, also, uh, what you can do is you, uh, on the network level, you only allow certain users, and it is possible to use strong authentication for printers um, based on IPP, based on HTTPS, to only allow really certain users to, to print, um, and then uh, you type a certain pin, and then the paper is released. So, um, no one else is able to access the printer, and you must trust your users, of course. Um, that is possible, but in real-world scenarios, I've never seen that uh, implemented. Okay, thank let's you. thank the speaker again.